but this is talk eight, obviously, um, of functional programming. And the general map of the talks has been something like this. Um, so talk eight today will cover using dynamic scopes and stuff, but we will also cover some of the bits from talk nine categories and monads. And then I've decided to delay composition because it actually got a little more interesting and could probably take a whole hour or something. So uh, first though, before we get into um, the, the business of today, we shall just run through the outline of the responses to the questions raised in talk seven. So one of the questions raised was, how do you count the iterations functionally? Because if you remember, I had used an increment function inside of that loop to increment the variable to count how many loops it was doing through that um, recursive function. And that's obviously not functional. So um, if you followed the earlier talks, it should be clear enough how to do that. So we use an inner function and we initialize the count to zero. And then the whole thing is done functionally as well. So you can play with that a bit when you when you have time. The other thing we were talking about was caching in memorization, where you have things that you store. And when we use the hash table for that, the, the other question was, do, when does it make sense to use a vector? So ELISP vectors are immutable, or at least the documentation says they're immutable. And uh, this is unlike common Lisp vectors, where you can ask common Lisp to make them extensible when you create them. So you can just keep adding stuff, like in C++ in vectors, you can keep adding stuff to, to vectors. But in arrays in C++, you can't add stuff to them. They have a, a fixed length when they're created. With common Lisp vectors, you can do both. With um, ELISP vectors, they're normally just created of a specific length, so um, you can you need an extra function call if you want to, to extend those. But then as you extend it, we need that extension to be able to memorize further return values. And they are particularly suitable for when the input are, when the input value is a non-negative integer, because then you can just do a direct lookup in the, in the vector and have a really fast return call. So another question raised was, we looked at the Fibonacci function quite a lot, and we had two distinct implementations, one of which was a naive recursion, which is the second one on this list. And the other one was the very mathematical one where we used some, some constants and stuff to have a really shortcut. Um, and the question was, how are they different? Given that they actually return the same values of all the numbers that we put into them. So one difference is how they behave on invalid inputs. So you can sort of decide for yourself whether you believe an invalid input should be should matter, uh, or that is outside the scope of the contract of your of your program. And the other question, uh, the other point to, is if k is very large and doesn't fit as um, or doesn't give you enough precision when it is converted to a floating point number in the first in the first function call. So you can imagine that with a, um, given that we sort of jump into floating point land and then jump back into integer land, you can lose position if that floating point is not long enough to hold the, all the numbers, all the precision you need. So that's also a, a notable difference. The second function, given a, a large integer k as input, will take forever to run, but it will return the right value. Then we looked at pipes. Uh, so pipes in the sense of having a, a lazy computation where you can just keep adding to the stuff um, as you need it. So you potentially you can have an infinite sequence like IOTA, where you just say, I want it up to a certain point, and, and you can use a function like take here, pipe take, to decide how much you want to calculate of a potentially infinite function. So in this function, for example, we use uh, a pipe to create a sequence starting at one up to a certain number. 
the pipe ensure function will then ensure that it has a, the, the right length and pipe take will take the first k values of those and then we just call reduce on that and we get a factorial. So uh, one question I raised was whether it would make sense to have the, the, the um, if you remember, the pipe was sort of implemented as a cons, as a pair, using a cons. And the question was whether it makes sense to have the function first and then the rest of the values later after that. So you always have the function as the first element in the list. And um, that probably is a good idea, like in this example. So I have rewritten the functions that we had in talk seven to take the function, the recursive function first, and then you get the values that come out of applying that recursive function n times following that thing, right? So if you actually want the values, you just have to CDR that function off the, the list. So essentially pipes are just lists, but um, they're just clever lists that know how to extend themselves because, um, so with the definitions pipe ensure here and pipe take, then uh, they will just behave as um, as we had last time, but they will be more efficient because the function is now stored first. So for many of the function calls, you only have to just mess with the first values of the list and then return the the, the updated list. Okay, um, so we talked a lot about dynamic scope, which is um, dynamic. Um, indefinite extent and the um, sort of the the lifetime potentially is from when the variable is created to when it's no longer created but dynamic scope potentially is visible from everywhere not just within the lexical scope of the variable when you declare that so one of the th there was a number of things that had dynamic scope like um, when you throw out of a loop when you raise an exception that will have a um, when you do a, a throw and you have a catch outside that throw the the name of that throw will have dynamic scope and i'll just use the dynamic scope term as as um, the shorthand for for the whole thing about scope and extent that we talked about last time. So functions are in that category as well. Functions are in principle visible everywhere. Some lisps like SPCL will complain if you try to use a, a function or it, it parses a function that doesn't yet exist. So it kind of likes you to build lisp from the ground up and uh, like the lower level functions, the, the leaf functions, if you will, first, and then build them up from there. But Emacs doesn't care. So Emacs, you can have a, f a function that refers to other functions, which may not exist. And that's okay, as long as they don't get called. And that's kind of a neat way of defining programs, because um, you can write your program from the top down in Emacs and it will just cheerfully, um, as long as you don't call the functions that don't exist, then it's happy. But you can also stub those functions. You can create an interim thing that just returns a, a dummy value or, or something or, or actually prompts you for the return value till you get the real function implemented in that, that position. So you can just put the stub in and the program will cheerfully call the stub and once you are happy with that it's working then you can replace the stub with the actual function that you wanted in that place and because the function names are using dynamic scope throughout the functions are visible at all times and it will just call whichever one you have defined most recently and we can even make use of that to debug stuff if we really wanted to. This is probably not the best way to debug things, but because they're dynamically scoped, I can create an inner value of a function that replaces the outer one, no matter where it's called. 
because in dynamic scope, if you remember, the, the, it is the lifetime that's dynamic from when I create the inner binding till the end of the inner binding. Anywhere in that program, the inner function will be used in preference to the outer function that it's shadowing. So here, I'm taking the pipe and show from before. Um, if I replace that with a print function, uh, like it prints its, its value and then it returns 8765. So this is just like a stub. This is before I actually define the real pipe ensure. And I want to debug the functions that are calling it. Then I stub it using flat. So I create a temporary binding of the pipe ensure function and then I call my factorial. And if you remember the de definition of the factorial from here, it's called pipe in the middle. But because it's inside of this flat, it will now call my stub rather than calling the, the global one. And the global one at this point may not exist, or it may ex exist, but it will be ignored because it's shadowed. So dynamically, I can replace functions that I'm calling with other functions like stubs or debugging functions, or I can trace the values that come in and come out again. And um, that may be helpful for, for debugging purposes. Um, I'm not sure how useful it is in an actual programming context, but there might be things you can do like um, dynamic, um, sort of like polymorphic stuff or something that you may want to do with functions rather than objects. And, and you can use that by shadowing the, the function definition in the right places where you want it. So, yes. Is that like mocking? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay, um, so this is a little bit technical, but it's actually quite a powerful thing because it means we can just put programs together the way we want to, and it will automatically pick up the right value of the, the function whenever the, the one that's defined. So you can take a function and, and you and you do this all the time when you program, you overwrite your defun by um, calling it again. And then the old value is, is essentially thrown away. Um, but you can actually do that dynamically as well. So uh, here, if you if we really go into the inner insides of what's going on, it's it's uh, when I have this factorial call inside of the flat, it will approximately expand to something like this. The nth CTR comes from the take. Print 12 comes from my stub. And the return 8765 comes from the stub as well. And the make pipe call that is inside the pipe ensure in the factorial function is called, but the value is ignored. So um, that's just sort of expanding what's happening sort of very approximately. So you may think, OK, I'm, I'm stubbing this pipe ensure. Can I call the global one that I have shadowed? So I could use that, for example, to print the value that's coming in, uh, maybe, um, and then call the global one, and then maybe do something to that value as well, the one that is returned from the global one, and then return that to the thing that called me. And unfortunately, you can't do that with this because the, the inner pipe ensure in the stub is the only one that's visible. Whenever you call that pipe ensure, it will pick up the inner one because that binding is in effect. And the outer binding is shadowed and is not reachable by the code, or at least not very easily by the code. You have to do some really um, strange stuff to get it if it's possible. Um, so yeah, you, you can't really do that. Um, if you wanted to do that, then there are other things we can do. So if you may be familiar with the trace function, where you, you say, I want to trace the function pipe ensure, and then it will take any call to that and replace that with something that prints the value that's going in and prints the value that's coming out and then returns that value. 
and later in the talk when we get to sort of past the category stuff then we'll get to how to do that sort of stuff okay so um this essentially covers all the stuff from talk seven uh the dynamic scope and and things answers to the questions and why that sort of stuff is potentially useful and and why you might care that some variables and some uh, and all functions and um, quite a lot of other things are dynamically scoped and uh, other places you have lexical scopes like enclosures. So uh, this is a little bit of a digression uh, which should um, get us into the category stuff at some point. Um, and this is just like um, picking up stuff from previous talks. So I'll just rattle through this fairly quickly. We talked about pure functions a lot, which are functions that return values and they have no side effects but functions with no side effects may not be sufficient for what you want to do because you may want to prompt the user for input saying hello user should i send this mail to to your boss or not i actually have a function like that in emacs i have one that says send this mail to your boss yes or no and um then it, it needs a response from me, which may be a yes, it may be a no. So the program has no way of knowing what that is because the response comes from me. So it has no way of knowing in advance what the return value of that function is, despite the input being the same every time. So it's not a pure function. So this function obviously serves an actual feature in my program. So it uh, we need a way to model that somehow like how do you stuff how do you get stuff from the user from the file system that you actually need for your your program the same thing with random numbers every time you call the random function you probably get a different value hopefully you get a different value so in common lisp this is modeled by having a dynamically scoped variable called random state it's always called random state, but the actual content of the variable is implementation specific. And Emacs does it something very similar. It just does it a little, little bit behind the scene, but having a random state is useful because you can save it. And then you can often in science programming, you want to have the ability to replicate a sequence of random numbers that you get. So you do that by reinitializing the random state to a known state, and then you will get the same sequence every time. And you can use that for, for testing and, and that, that kind of stuff. So it's useful to have access to the random state so you can reinitialize it, except you have to bear in mind that the contents, as I said, is implementation specific. There are also global variables that, are, that affect how things work. So um, print length, for example, will say how much of stuff should I print? because you've often seen that Emacs, when it prints out stuff, it will try and truncate them a bit if they're too long. So in the first example here, I have a print length, which is a dynamically scoped variable, and I bind it to five. And then I call print make vector 200. So that's a vector of length 200 with, with, with just zeros in it. And you can see the first, uh, when the, when the print is called, the print length is set to five. And because it's a dyna dynamically scoped variable, it will implicitly affect the print function, which checks the value of that variable and says, okay, I will only print five elements from that vector. When the function exits, the result of the make vector, the 200 length vector, will then be printed by the REPL, by the P, the print in the REPL. And it, you can see it has a longer print length because it prints more zeros from that vector. A slightly more sophisticated example is to look at print circle. So we have looked before at code or um, uh, sort of input code list structures that reference themselves. So what I create here is a list of one, two, three, four, but I take the CDR of the final element of the list and, repl and replace it with a pointer to the list itself. So we get a circular list. When you print it out, 
if you're not careful, you will get one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, and so on forever. So some Lisps will not detect that unless you ask them to, and just basically print forever until you hit, hit Control C or something, or Control G in, in Emacs, obviously. But Emacs is clever enough to, to, to do this. So um, I set the variable print circle T, which tells print to detect if it's printing an infinite list that's, that's um, looping back on itself. And it will detect that, and it will print a shortcut notation, which could be read back in, because you recognize probably the hash one, which says um, hash one is the beginning of the list, which is then referenced as the CDR of the last element, the last const cell of the list as well. So you get the circular list. So this notation hash one equal one, two, three, four dot hash one. This is the, the way that you, or one way you could actually write this into the REPL and get a circular list. And that is what print does when print circle is set to true. If print circle is false, you could conceptually get this one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four forever. And what you get here in, in Emacs is a sort of truncated version of that. It prints one, two, three, four, uh, like one, two, three, four, and then one, two, then it's got 10 elements. And then it says, this looks like it's an infinite one. Um, I'm going to give up and print something. So this second thing is what comes out of the REPL, the print of the REPL when it's returning the value of the list, the, the, which came like it's returned from the print. Print Y will actually print Y and then return Y and then the REPL will print Y again. But this time print circle is nil, which is the default value. Because normally print circle is off because it's extra computation to calculate, to watch everything for whether it's an infinite list or not. So normally print circle is only set to true if you actually need it. And therefore it's normally false. And that's when you can get the infinite printouts or here Emacs will truncate it to something that's, that wouldn't be valid input, but at least it's not infinitely long. So again, um, this is just an example of where dynamically scoped variables can affect how functions behave. And this is precisely the behavior we want because we don't want them to calculate expensive um, tests all the time. We just want them to do the expensive tests of whether this is a recursive list, a circular list, when we know we need it. Yes, David. Is, is the should the let's be there flat or is let that's okay on those two examples? It's so it's a let because it's a, a variable. So the print, uh, which, which so we, we don't change the function that we call, okay. we just change a variable that affects the function's oh, behavior. Print length. Okay, cool. Yeah, okay. so print circle is basically like a flag. You could set that as a parameter to the function. You can't do that to print because print is too old for for in, in Lisp um, archaeology. But there is a, an underlying function called write where you can pass all these functions, um, all these function parameters individually as named parameters, saying um, you can pass it explicitly a print circle, uh, true or false, and print length, um, any number you want, and, and so on. But yes, so these are basically like uh, what in, in simpler languages you would call a global variable kind of thing. It affects all print functions that are called within um, at that time. And because the print circle is true just inside the scope of this let, then it will affect all calls to print within the, uh, while the program is inside of that let. And then the print circle will revert to the global value, or you, the, this global, global value will stop being shadowed when we exit the let. The closure we looked at last time also is a kind of a side effect thing because it has its own state built into it. So that's a, like another example of it. There is also um, the throws that I just mentioned. Um, they also 
obviously side effects when a function can um, has a non-local exit, then it's not a pure function and you need perhaps a way to model how you do functions that can throw because they can their behavior can be quite um, uh, they're, they're not like a pure function anymore necessarily. So for example, um, some people would just throw for really exceptional cases like invalid inputs. Uh, that may be a, a valid approach. Often I use throws for deeply nested loops and stuff when I search at a structure and I find the value that I found um, inside of that structure. And I don't want to sort of recurse all the way back up and out of it again. So I just throw saying, oh, I found it. And then it'll be caught by a higher level function that, that has called the whole search thing. Okay, um, so that was a quick tour of side effects. There are other sort of higher level functional programming things that I may want to talk about at some point, but they are rather more sophisticated and a little bit out of scope of Emacs Lisp. So maybe we'll do those and maybe we'll not. But to me, these sort of show the power of a Lisp, modern Lisp system. You can do a lot of um, sophisticated programming in Lisp if you really dig into it. And now to categories. Yay, categories. So today's introduction to categories will just cover the, the basics of what a category is and why we would be interested in a category. But we will have a sneak peek at monads. We will not have the whole definition of what a monad is and all the end of functor stuff. But we will get close enough to that, that we will get to it next time. And then next time we will look at some more technical details of why categories are, are interesting. But in, in loose terms, a category consists of objects and arrows. Objects are like the A, B, C, D, E here, and the arrows are like the arrows I've drawn between those. So you can have multiple arrows between objects and an object will always have an arrow to itself called the identity arrow and composition of arrows is well defined. So you have an object uh, A, which has an arrow to the object B, which in turn has an arrow to the object C and there's an object, um, there's an arrow from object A to object C, which is the composition of those two. So, um, here, obviously, they're just arrows on the screen. So you may ask, what is composition? Um, so let's try and define that. So in, in more formal language, an, a category is a triple, which com consists of objects, arrows, and composition. Objects will just be um, a set of things, can be anything, in anything you like. Um, they're typically mathematical objects, but they don't have to be. Arrows are arrows from one object to another object. So every arrow has something it's a source and a destination, something it's coming from and something it's arrowing to. And then there's the composition. So if F is an arrow from A to B and G is an arrow from B to C, and H is an arrow from C to D, then you get the, the composition which exists and the composition is associative. So um, if, if you draw those as rectangles, you can sort of see how they, they um, it, geometrically, it maybe doesn't make sense, but in applications of categories, it makes sense because the associative law of composition is um, almost ubiquitous. So in applications of category, of categories, you make the category more powerful by having the associativity of the, of the composition. Incidentally, it was precisely the composition that I wanted to talk about in talk eight and have decided to postpone. So we will come back to composition in Lisp as well, but uh, for now, let's just look at composition in categories. But you can sort of think of them as, as functions in, in Lispy terms. So if A is a set of numbers, 
and b is another set of numbers uh, so a could be floating point numbers and b could be integers and the arrow between them could be round like we saw before in our fibonacci function so round is a function that takes general floating point numbers and converts them to integers so if you had a single number 2.35 and you call round on it you get the number two so you can look at 2.35 as an object and two as an object and the function round takes 2.35 and maps it to two and it also takes 3.14 and maps it to three while being the same function so you can sort of see in that sense the lisp function round will be an implementation of several arrows of objects if you look at each number as an object and we'll return to that a bit so if, if if it makes your head hurt don't worry too much about it we will get back to it the other thing we have is an identity object so if the identity object composed with f will always yield f whenever that definition is um, meaningful like um, from f you get the source and the destination and then you compose the that with the identity function on the destination and that just gives you f again and the same for the source so that is a category and at this point you're probably if you haven't seen it before you're probably wondering why categories are useful at all why we have to go to this formality when i could just have told you about the round function in lisp and you you would have nodded wisely and said yes i know that one so part of the reason for why we why we want categories is that they're kind of generalizations of lots of mathematical structures that are already used in many branches of mathematics so looking at arrows as functions functions are kind of ubiquitous uh, looking at um, at arrows also means that we are not looking inside the object and that is crucial so we're just studying objects by studying the arrows between them we are not studying arrows um, themselves like the round function we just care that it maps 2.35 to 2 and we're not study studying the the numbers like as a set we are studying the numbers in terms of the functions on the numbers if that makes sense so we study objects by studying the arrows between the objects and you will see some examples of that in the next talk uh, some more sophisticated examples of that how you can construct um, very natural categories by just looking at the arrows between objects rather than having to look inside of objects so anyway um, home a b is the the set of all arrows from a to b where a and b are objects and um, that's just a notation like a, a homomorphism or, or a morphism in this case and that just is because of the mathematical baggage because they are in some branches of mathematics these things are called homomorphisms but they could be all sorts of things they could just be functions they could be um, we'll see some examples very shortly so one of the things you can construct using just arrows and not having to look inside objects is products So here I have formed, uh, in some sense, pairs of objects. So one being uh, from one category and another being from another category. So you can kind of see that as a product category of um, arrows being defined by composing those. Like you could have a, a pair of um, floating points and integers, and then you could have the function round, which happens to well you probably need something that takes floating point to floating point and integers to integers um, and then that could be an an arrow in in that product category so um it, yeah okay we'll see how that's useful later <laughs> 
so normal examples of things um, if <clears throat> the category of sets is a category if you're a little bit careful we will not go into that why you have to be careful because um, you can get to the Russell paradox uh, from this one where you look at um, the sets that include all sets that do, uh, whatever it'll be that do not include themselves um, you know that sort of stuff there you have to have to be a little bit careful with that but we will totally ignore that for this this talk so if if you have a set which is um, like of numbers one two three four and then you have another set of numbers um, or star and triangle or something and then the the morphisms will be all the functions from one two three four to star and triangle and um, the same thing for all the other sets whenever composition makes sense then the composition of functions is is uh, is defined and it's associative just like normal stuff the same thing in the category of abelian groups and topological spaces if you know that sort of stuff so you can you can sort of see that um yeah they're just like normal functions the kind of functions you're used to and the objects are either sets or they're sets with some kind of structure the morphisms are functions or they're functions that preserve the structure if the objects have structure on them slightly more exotic categories um, can also be helpful because it, if you think about them hard enough then either they make you they improve your understanding of what categories are or they make your head hurt or both so for example you can think of a category with only a single element in it and it has the identity arrow because every element must have an identity arrow that is a category it's not a very interesting one but um, it is a category you can have a category with two elements that have then the identity arrows and they have arrows from a to b but they have two arrows from a to b that are different what they are it doesn't really matter um, as long as they have two arrows you can sort of imagine the the category as being isomorphic with another category so it doesn't really matter what the arrows are it's just an and there's an arrow from a to b and there's another arrow which is not the same as the first arrow and that gives you a category of two objects with two arrows between them and then there are the identity arrows from a to a and b to b which we haven't drawn in this this picture for item three we're considering a single element which we happen to to call star here but the arrows but there will be several arrows from star to itself and if you think about this because you have this associative law and because you can always compose arrows from star to star with themselves that forms a group so essentially a group can be modeled with a category of a single element where the elements of the group are now arrows from that element to itself and the group operation is composition of those arrows if you think about that that actually makes sense why you would want to do that um, is a good question but it it means that the categories can model groups rather simply and the last example is kind of fun um, so if you have matrices and then you will have um, uh, so um, matrices have rows and they have columns and they have a certain number of rows and columns and you can define for all numbers one two whatever um, you can define a matrix with that number of rows and you can with that number of columns and you can view that as an arrow from the number of rows to the number of columns and then if, if you think of multiplication then on the next matrix when you multiply them together you want the number of rows of the on the second matrix to be identical to be the same as the number of columns on the first matrix and you will then multiply them together in in whatever order makes sense 
and that gives you a morphism from uh, what is effectively the rank of the, the matrix in, in some sense, like the number of rows to the number of columns of, of the result, if that makes sense. If it doesn't make sense, don't worry about it. It's not important. It's just an exotic example um, that is, is kind of fun to think about because it shows that categories can do slightly weird things, but they sometimes help you understand what categories can do. And as I said, sometimes they make your head hurt and then you just move on to something else. We will not need any of this weird stuff in, in this talk. But as I said, they're used to, to study things and because they're generalizations of so many things like natural stuff we've seen before and exotic stuff like we've just seen, then uh, they, they kind of form a unified language of how these things work. We, we study th things by studying morphisms between things. And in the next talk, as I said, you will, um, there will be some more examples of, of how this works. And we will actually derive, I think we will derive the um, product category just using arrows rather than just um, the hand wavy pairs that I introduced before. Okay, so a functor, so what is a functor? A functor is an arrow between categories. Now, um, again, this is possibly the place where your, your head might start to hurt. Hang on. Arrows have categories. Arrows are things in categories. How can they also be things between categories? And um, there are theorists out there who like to think about these kind of things. So what's basically happening is we have a category C and we have a category D and the functor maps objects from category C to objects in category D. So in that case, it's, it's kind of like a, um, it's a function. It maps objects to objects. It also maps the arrows between the objects inside of category C two arrows between the same object, the, the maps of the those objects in D. So it, when if, if you have two objects, X and Y in C, and the functor maps those to FX and FY, which are objects in D. If you now have an arrow from X to Y inside of C, let's call it um, M then f of m is an arrow from fx to fy in d and you will see a lot of that stuff in the next talk because um, there's a lot of functors are extremely useful and you can you can look as a functor as an arrow inside the category of categories so the category um, if category C is an object and category D is an object, then a functor is simply an arrow from C to D. So you can sort of scale out a bit and look at um, a category of categories. And again, you have to be a little bit careful that it, they don't grow too large, like the Russell paradox we had with sets. But let's not, we will cheerfully ignore that sort of stuff. So anyway, that's what a functor is. And if you've heard the word endofunctor in connection with monads, then um, uh, an endofunctor is quite simply a, a functor that maps a category to itself. So if you remember, a category uh, has every object in a category has an identity arrow to itself. The object, the category C, as an object in the category of categories also has an arrow to itself, namely the identity functor, which maps every object to itself, every arrow to itself. That's the identity functor. So every category has an identity functor, but it could also have other functors from itself to itself, 
and these in general are just called endofunctors in case you're wondering where that thing that name came from so um so we'll get back to that when we actually get to the introduction of, of monads i will not introduce monads in this talk but we will ch we will cheat and have a sneak peek at the applications of monads in in programming so that you have a, a feel for what the what we're actually doing in in this um, what the, the purposes of this whole talk so um one good example that is surprising um that you you may find it surprising that it's useful at all is the forgetful functor so if i have a an abelian group for example which could be the numbers uh, zero to six and i look at those um as an uh, under addition modulo seven that's an abelian group and um every arrow from that object to itself will be a homomorphism of groups from the group modulo seven to the group modulo seven there's the identity arrow which just takes every element to itself and there's the, the uh, there's a, a function that multiplies every element by two and every element by three or whatever there will be lots of them and you could probably enumerate all of them if you had some um coffee ready the forgetful functor simply forgets that it's a group and just looks at it as a set of elements zero to six and then it says yeah the functions that were functions before with them um, a billion homomorphisms they're still functions you will have loads of other functions as well that were not uh, sourced from a uh, homomorphism of groups which just happen to map the set of numbers one to six, uh, zero to six, to the set of numbers zero to six. So the forgetful functor just basically forgets the structure on the um, whatever is is on it, and you can introduce those in layers. So, for example, you could have um, uh, modules over a ring, and then it forgets that, um, and and you can just forget part of the structure and just look at them as abelian groups, for example, or vector spaces. Just look at them as abelian groups, and um, because you can, you just choose to throw away multiplication by a scalar, and just look at the addition of vectors with each other, or or whatever. You know, you can you just throw away something, and that's the forgetful functor. And we will see um, possibly in the next talk that they can actually be useful. Um, in in certain constructions and which i find somewhat surprising so uh this is my last slide and we're also running out of time so that's good um so in the in programming you may ask what is the point of all this why are we talking about monads so let t be a category of things like types like strings and floats and integers but also potentially lists and sets and vectors and and what other constructions you have in your code in in lisp so essentially t is a category of types and the arrows the, the between the types are the functions that take one type to another type so all the functions are functions of a single argument and they have a single output so for example, um, if you look at the type a non-negative integer, then the factorial function that we spent some time looking at takes that type to itself. Because you feed a non-negative integer into the factorial functions and out pops a non-negative integer. And the same thing for the Fibonacci functions, you feed a non-negative integer into it and out pops a non-negative integer. So both of those are arrows from the type non-negative integer to itself and obviously for every type you will also have an identity arrow namely the function that takes um, every element of that type to itself so as an example um, 
let us look at the particular functor that takes types t to lists of t. So this is a functor within the category, as long as you're happy that lists are also types. And the constraint is that you will have lists of integers, you will have lists of strings, but you can't mix them. Now, you can't have lists uh, that contain both integers and strings and floats. Well, we, we know we can in Lisp because we can just do Lisp, list whatever. And these are still lists of a specific type, as long as you take that type to be universal, lists of T, where T is the, the everything type in Lisp, when we, if you remember the type system. But for, for this purpose, let's just ignore that. We, we have lists of integers, lists of floats, and lists of strings, and that is a, a functor from types to itself. And you can see that the object um, if we look at a particular instance of, a, of the type, like uh, the number three, uh, if I take list three, then I get an, an instance of a list of integers, namely the list of the integer three. And you can see, if you think about it, that the functor on the arrows is macro, because it takes a function from one integer to another integer and gives you a function of a list of integers to a list of integers. Namely, by applying that function to every element of the list, as you know Mapcar does. So that's essentially what a monad sets out to do. It gives you a language to talk about you have stuff and then you, you have some sort of space of, of things like a list of, of things in this case. And you take the, the arrows between the things like arrows between integers and transfer them into arrows between lists of things. So this this is sort of a sneak peek of list is is then one of the uh, so why is this a monad I hear you ask and why is this useful I hear you ask and these are very valid questions and hopefully we'll return to those in the next talk because this is my last slide and I, we have run out of time so um, next talk will be a little bit more technical in the in the category part and we will get into some of the things of, of other kinds of monads and why they are potentially useful and, and possibly we can have a discussion about um, whether we believe that or not. <laughs>